Thank you, Tom. Well, I just wanted to say that even though I've lived here, what did I say, John? 42 years, which I'll talk about. Uh, I learned some things from what John uh, said, and I worked for the village for 24 years, and I knew about the names of the streets, but I never realized, even though I had two children and a grandchild to go through Rich East, about Gold, Green, and Rich Road. So I'm going to share that when I get home. Um, you know, I'm retired from the village, and I got involved in the village because I was involved in other organizations. Uh, I easily got involved in the PTA and uh, became president of the PTA and got involved in the League of Women Voters. And then that's how I got to working for the village of Park Forest, how I got um, noticed enough uh, uh, to come to work for the village of Park Forest. And now that I'm retired, I'm back to volunteering and still being involved in the League of Women Voters and diversity dinners and any number of things. So sometimes when people ask me how's retirement, uh, I have to tell them about a t-shirt that I saw shortly after I retired that said, I'm retired. I was tired yesterday and I'm tired again today. <laughs> but I love still being involved in the community. Um, but when I, I want to start with my history with discrimination so you can understand why I love Park Forest and have stayed here for 42 years. I grew up in Joliet, Illinois, not so far from here, just down Route 30. And I was in high school in the, in the, 60, in the 50s, rather. In fact, that was Joliet Township, and they didn't have an East nor West then, and you all didn't have Rich Township. And there was no Lincoln Way High School. They all went to uh, Joliet Township High School in that first year, so we had a humongous graduating class, something like 700 people now this year now next year we're getting ready for our 60th um, high school reunion. I grew up at a time when it was legal to discriminate. If you were colored, you could swim in no park swimming pool only on Monday mornings because they clean the pool for the week on Monday afternoon. And I remember walking home from school one day and I stopped at a restaurant in downtown Ch Joliet to make a phone call and a woman got so upset with me and she said get out of here get out of here she was a waitress because she thought I was coming in the restaurant to eat and you know it was it was just that phone that was at the door and I was president of Tri High Y, and I don't wonder if they still have that, even though colored folks couldn't join uh, the Y. And the reason that happened is because, first of all, I have a very, very, very strong, wonderful family, but allies, people who didn't look like me who stood up with me, who made sure we were included, because there were only a handful of us. In grade school, you would be the only black child in this class, and it went on, on to high school. But they, they were people who were Caucasian, who made sure that we were uh, treated correctly and uh, included in things. So when we were house hunting, and then I moved to Chicago, uh, well, I went away to school for a year or two, and then I moved to Chicago, and as you move from neighborhood to neighborhood, the whole neighborhood would change from all white to all colored. I keep using that term because that was the term we used at that time. And um, you always breathe a sigh of relief. Um, and when you got in there, nothing happened because strange things could happen. And so much so that when we finally picked Park Forest, the, we decided before we did that is to go to the Leadership Council for Open Metropolitan Communities, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was an organization formed after Martin Luther King in his March for Fair Housing in Chicago. 
and uh, Kel Williams was his executive director, and they helped minorities locate communities where they would be comfortable and accepted. So we started looking all over at different communities. Uh, we started in the south suburbs. It never even occurred to us to consider the non-traditional areas north and west of us. But after looking at several communities, we decided to, to move to Park Forest. Uh, we moved to Park Forest because we wanted better schools uh, for kids. That was it. We wanted to get into good schools. If things didn't, if things went downhill after they all finished school, we were just going to bamboozle right out of here. Uh, but we ended up staying. But when my dad met us at the house um, when we were moving in that day, and it was March of well, it was 74, I think. Um, he was sweeping the garage and he said, well, it's still standing. And that's the fear we grew up with. And the, and the, and the odd thing is my husband, who was from Selma, Alabama, did not experience the same fears that I did. I don't know, it was more well-defined. They knew where they could go and what they could do. And here in the up north, you didn't know. People would say, welcome to New Lenox, but as a black person, you didn't always know if you were going to be comfortable there, or welcome to Crete, and things of that sort. And um, when I went to school, I went to a, a traditionally black university, Fisk University in Nashville, and I understood. Everybody knew where they could go. Colored people had their own uh, restaurants and dance halls and things of that sort, so they were very comfortable. But I grew up with that fear. So I knew that Park Forest was known for being an integrated community and welcoming blacks. But now I'm back to blacks, but that's okay. Over the years I've been called everything from colored black to now African American. Um, and so you'll find me interchanging uh, those um, titles. But anyway, um, I knew that they had a, they were very welcoming to blacks, but I also thought they have to have a quota, and maybe we're the hundredth family, and they won't want us. But that isn't what happened. My, when my neighbors next door came over uh, to, to welcome us and bring us donuts, and when their for sale sign went up, I thought, oh my God, we're going to have that rapid racial change. And rapid racial change, racial change doesn't have to be a problem if you uh, have good services and things of that sort. If you're segregated all white or all black, as long as you have good services, that's, that would be fine. But we know that what would happen uh, when it was rapid racial ch change, there would be benign neglect. But, I, but then some friends of mine actually uh, moved in the house next door and they were of uh, African heritage. And when they moved, a white family, uh, I think it was Georgia O'Neill, who's now a trustee on our board, bought that house. And so I saw, I saw something I had never seen uh, growing up in Chicago and growing up in Joliet. And what I also experienced was that there was no decline in services because the minority population was growing very slowly at the time. I think, Dora, you probably moved here about the same time I did. Um, but they still maintained streets. They still maintained the cultural amenities. Uh, they didn't feel that we ain't got no class just because we have colored folks here doesn't mean we ain't got no class. And that really uh, meant a lot. But I also had a friend, uh, Myrtle Martin, before we moved here, who was serving on the Commission on Human Relations, who knew about racial steering and things of that sort. And she had warned us, make sure you see as many options as you can. And we were considering considering uh, Berry Street in, in East Lincolnwood. And um, they had started calling it Blackberry. And Myrtle, who didn't know us, but because she knew one of my family members who lived in Glenwood, you know, kept coaching us. So that's how we knew to select a block so that we didn't have this, and you, I'll talk about it later, this block by black block resegregation that occurs in the city. 
So we moved here in 1974. We've stayed here for 42 years, mainly because, because of the great services, the great nonpartisan government. When I did work for the village, it was wonderful. Um, I've had colleagues that worked in other communities doing the same work I did, which was uh, community relations work. And they were always, under the thumb of a trustee or a mayor, and it's never been uh, like that in Park Forest. And that is an added bonus uh, to living and working in the community. There's no political favoritism, uh, believe me. So um, I was volunteering, I was working for the League of Women, with the League of Women Voters of Park Forest, and I was encouraged to apply, apply for the job of a community um, I'm sorry, assistant uh, to the director of economic development and um, community relations. But before that, Park Forest had a great history in its integration efforts. Uh, we, were one of the, we were one of the communities, mainly only, that adopted our fair housing ordinance in 1968 just a few months before the federal fair housing law was adopted. And then we formed uh, the Park Forest Commission on Human Relations to enforce this fair housing ordinance. And the fair housing um, uh, board, and the Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity Board. Now, I wanted to explain that first of all, as John indicated, um, I think you said the police chief, and was it the mayor? Yeah. That went house to house when people, um, uh, black people were moving into the community. Uh, there was a special outreach to get the first black to move in. He moved into Eastgate, right? And um, his neighbor painted his side of the fence the new resident side of the fence black and his side of the fence white, but that was the only incident. But after that, the Commission on Human Relations was sent out to follow up on visiting homes where they, that time they knew where people of color were moving to. Some of the things that they did for a positive impact on integration could, if in the wrong hands, be misused. You know, they had these pins and dots and things because they knew where we were going. And then at the same time, uh, blacks were encouraged to live, uh, not, not have themselves locked into just a certain area, cl clustering, no apartheid. So they were encouraged, not forced, but encouraged to move in an area that would avoid that racial isolation or what we call that black, block by black um, discrimination that had happened in, in, the, in the city of Chicago, which was our closest reference. Now, I don't know if you realize it or not, but that segregation in Chicago and other cities did not just occur on its own. It's because the federal housing of the federal FHA had a requirement in their rules that once a colored person what moved into a block, you could no longer sell homes in that block to whites. So all of this segregation stuff that we're facing metropolitan-wise started because of, of uh, that kind of leadership. But here they were bound and determined to avoid it. And one of the things I want you to know, uh, we had it a little bit easier as far as segregation and integration was concerned because we were that planned community. We were starting from scratch. We hadn't had hate groups. We didn't have organizations, you know, organized around uh, different issues and wanting to block people out. So it was an easy move. And so we are uh, very fortunate to have come into a community that looked at this uh, issue long before um, it had grown, you know, uh, at, a, at a rapid rate. In fact, it's so funny to live in, in a community where I'm older than the community. <laughs> but anyway, what I'm trying to understand, I'm getting you to understand at the beginnings before, uh, because what happens in some uh, communities is that you have these organized organizations, and they may be what you think are great civic organizations who are not uh, the most liberal people in the world, and they would organize uh, um, against uh, things like integration. So our first director of, um, 
community relations, as it was called, was Don DeMarco. Uh, oh, I wanted to tell you what the, what the two commissions do. The Commission on Human Relations, if there is, because of our ordinance, which was substantially equi equivalent to the federal or ordinance, we could, we could file our own discrimination complaint. It could come through um, the Director of Community Relations. If it wasn't solved, that suit wasn't, uh, complaint wasn't solved administratively, then we referred it out to uh, the Fair Housing Review Board, but at the same time, the Park Forest Commission on Human Relations would help the complainant. And that's the way our law was set up. Uh, Don DeMarco, who really got us, uh, was our first community relations director, and he really got us set up. He was such a strong armed person and uh, scared the heck out of realtors that, uh, that he really, um, really has, I think, set the basis for our uh, ability to remain a welcoming, open community and to work as hard as we can against discrimination. And he formed, he had a, a program called Integration Maintenance. Now that was got to be, um, you know, as every term, after a while it gets to be a negative. Because uh, blacks like me, we thought it meant you're going to maintain just a few, that, you know, only 10%. And whites um, uh, felt that way too. And so they, would, they thought it pertained to a number. But it doesn't. Integration is integration. We just wanted to make sure that the community remained open and people were given the option of picking Park Forest and not, quote, steered to Park Forest. Um, and um, so when you talk about it, so we stopped using that term integration maintenance because it became a, ne a, a negative. Um, uh, I was going to say that um, Don um, would meet with with realtors and uh, talk to them about our efforts, but he would also sue them. We had contracted with the South Suburban Housing Center to do testing for discrimination, to see if people were being steered in or steered away from Park Forest. So I'm getting, it sort of gets a little tangled up here, but um, when, when um, Don got started, as I said, he filed lawsuits against realtors who steered home seek seekers. Have you all heard that word, steering? Yeah, they, the realtors are going to show you a limit, some realtors. There, we really had a lot of realtors at the time who, who worked with us because they were afraid of us. <laughs> they were afraid of, by the time um, Don, uh, Don left, uh, Kathy and I had it made because uh, uh, Don had scared them um, and they were, were afraid to do anything. But steering occurs for us, a, a region, because it's not just Park Forest, we're not an island. We're influenced by what goes on in the South Suburban region and what goes on in the metropolitan area. And so we're looking for steering in Park Forest or away from Park Forest, see if, and then also outside of Park Forest, and that's where an organization like the House, House, South Suburban Housing Center comes in. Uh, because they would send testers, let's say, to Orland Park, and they'd be black and white, and blacks were told in many cases, uh, well, you want to look at in the southern suburbs. You don't want to look here, and whites were shown homes in the area, in the office, uh, in the area in which the office was located that they had come to. So it was important to have uh, an organization like the Housing Center because uh, they could test outside of our jurisdiction. If a fair housing law was broken outside of Park Forest, I can't do anything about it, or I couldn't. I forget, I'm not employed anymore. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the housing center could. So what I wanted to say was that I pointed out that we are not an island. So the village of Park Forest was the lead community in organizing an um, organization that called, was called FLAC. The Fair House, Fair, oh wait, 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 wait. FLAC was the Fair Housing Legal Action Committee, and they were the ones that started mainly doing, uh, suing realtors uh, for, for steering. 
and we contracted with the housing center and uh, we involved all of our departments in fair housing efforts. Remember Tom said I was at the table when staff meetings and my job was to make sure that uh, all of the uh, departments understood our efforts at integration and did whatever they could do to make our residents feel good about the community and to want to stay in the community and whenever they heard negative things it was hopeful that they would be able to you know convince people that that just wasn't through uh, um, true. So I began working, for, and I'm kind of uh, going back here, I began working, uh, when, I, when I did begin working part-time, temporary part-time in 1983 uh, as assistant to Kathy McDonough, we developed a new resident packet which included surveys and that way we could track um, who was coming in, what their realtors had said to them, what other options they had been shown, what they liked about Park Forest, why did they pick it. That information was then sent to other departments, not necessarily the racial data, but the reasons people moved, because there were, we also had exit interviews, and that would help um, the departments realize what people, what was missing and what they maybe needed to do. And all of that is about keeping a community comfortable and happy in the, keeping, you know, the community comfortable and happy and stabilizing the community so that people weren't running away because of certain issues. Now, why did we collect data? You know, uh, the Fair Housing Law requir requires us, especially a community that gets CDBG funds, to be affirmatively furthering fair housing. And you need to know what the racial data is to know if you're doing that, if it's effective or not. And so without data, you have no idea where you're going. And so in 1983, we were able to start that program. We began meeting with realtors, and actually, Don DeMarco had done this a lot on his own, on a one-to-one -one basis or in group meetings. But before you could go, uh, a realtor could go soliciting in the village, they had to meet with me and it was funny because they had to pay in order to be registered in Park Forest to solicit you had to pay a whopping three cents was the fee well eventually we got rid of that nuisance fee but what it helped develop was they would come and meet with me and we would tell them all the things some of the things you're going to learn in these next few days a few few months about the village so that they could feel very good about showing all of their clients uh, the community and be better informed and they weren't treated like the enemy and they actually sort of became a part of our team when Marshall Fields was leaving at one time threatening to leave Park Forest it was surprising uh, how many realtors came to our aid and marched with us in downtown uh, Chicago as we marched around um, uh, the uh, Marshall Fields at State and Randolph and they were really our supporters because we try to positive intervention is much more acceptable than a negative one or always shaming and blaming and as we had those one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings with them we developed quite a uh, um, great relationship and we as I said we met on with them one-on-one -on -one. they I think they would be a little disturbed at first to think they had to come in and sit with me as I and they didn't know what I was going to talk about or do and talk about uh, our um, efforts at integration and how much we value integration. Um, I often told realtors, I use this analogy, if you're marketing the community to all of the prospective home seekers, the housing values are going to be remain steady and, and possibly grow. And because I remember this uh, ad that Wild Olds, Olds in Libertyville would have on TV and they were uh, uh, advertising. I thought, well, I live way out here in the south suburbs. Why the heck would I wait, go way up there to buy a car? But I use that as an example of why those cars were still in demand and why people wanted to buy them. And it's the same thing. We are a product when it came to selling homes and buying 
buying homes. And that was really kind of a, a, a eye-opening thing for me when I began to work for the village. So those were, we would talk about that, but we'd also talk about all the amenities that Park Forest had. We also met with co-op and apartment managers. Um, the co-ops were particularly good about trying to avoid um, those little, you know, the, what, what you call them, town, John, I can't think of uh, the, your neighborhoods in the co-ops there. The courts? The courts. They knew that, you know, they did, they tried to avoid uh, court by court segregation and they encouraged people to move in units where there, as I would say, blacks were underrepresented. Now, again, it's a choice. It's just making them aware of it and not um, made to do it. Now, one of the other things that we, uh, at the village, did and got involved with is uh, from 1983 to 1989, we were involved in a suit with the National Association of Realtors. The National Association of Realtors sued Park Forest and several other communities that belong to these agencies that I've talked about because of our fair housing law, because of our sign ordinance. What we would do in Park Forest is if there's a, a house in a block, if there's six for sale signs and you're a home seeker, are you going to want to move into that block? And uh, is it, you're going to say, what the heck is going on? So what we did was encourage realtors, we couldn't make them, to take turns and work with each other and keep the signs up for a while. One put their, uh, put their other, uh, one, another one take their signs down. What I'm trying to point out, it is very simple to do things. That's very easy. They're not hard things. So we had that uh, law and we had two or three other laws that the uh, National Association of Realtors uh, said were discriminatory and they sued us and we were in court for all those years and that's when I first started working for the village so I came in in the middle of of this lawsuit and um, we ended up winning even though they filed uh, as the offended member, as a, as a group that was being discriminated against. But one of the funny stories is I um, was um, going to possibly testify and so I was sitting outside the courtroom. If you were going to testify, you shouldn't be in the courtroom while the proceedings are going on. And my friend and colleague in University Park, who is also named Barbara, Barbara McKinley, was in the courtroom. And uh, this really kind of little snappy uh, attorney for the National Association of Realtors got up and spoke to the judge and said, Your Honor, I realize that Barbara Morse may be uh, testifying later, but she shouldn't be in the courtroom. And it was Barbara McKinley. And they said, oh, no. And, and they said the judge just fell back laughing because that's what the case was about. We all look alike. We all are problems. And it just demonstrated everything. So for after that, I had a T-shirt that says, no, I am not Barbara McKinley, nor am I uh, Aretha Franklin, you know. <laughs> These kind of things. So. <laughs> we, we had a lot of fun uh, with that. Park Forest was also instrumental in uh, forming CAFA, the Chicago Area Fair Housing Alliance. It, what, the reason we were instrumental, Evanston and Park Forest had um, fair housing laws equivalent to the federal fair housing law. So that meant that we got funding and we could use um, our status to help form this committee. Before that, there was the Metropolitan Planning Group uh, that was composed of people from municipalities that worked on fair housing issues and uh, housing centers. So those two groups merged and became the Chicago Area Fair Housing uh, Alliance. And we were one of those organizations that was able to support that and uh, get that going. Because again, we're not an island. What's going on in the Chicago metropolitan area is extremely, imp uh, we're impacted by everything that goes on in the region. Um, then we've, um, we're part of the organization, founding groups that started the Unity Coalition of the Southern Suburbs. I don't know if you all know about that one, but we would meet 
uh, the first one we had, first big deal we had was um, what we call Hands Across the Southland. Now the reason we got started with that, we got a call uh, from Bev Sokol, who lives in Olympia Fields, who was concerned about the image of the South Suburban region. I don't know if any of you remember seeing a TV, um, uh, was it Dateline or Nightline or something on um, NBC with Tom Brokaw, where they did a story about uh, Madison in white flight. And they pictured a woman who was in Lincoln Mall at the time when it was thriving, but she was scared to be with it not us, not black people, we were it, and she was moving, and that's the way the whole 60 minutes went. So there were people in the region that were concerned about our image. Um, and, um, there, and so they, they called on, my other colleague was Robin Kelly, who uh, worked in Madison. So they called on Robin and me, uh, to talk to them about how do we uh, work to um, negate what happened in that uh, uh, TV special. And we, so we met with Bev and she got several other people together and what we ended up doing was having the first year what we call Hands Across the Southland. You know how they had Hands Across America? And we all held hands. I think it might have started the hand holding, I may have started, I don't think we had Old Plank Trail yet, I'm not sure. The Spice South is Salt Trail. Right. It went all the way into New Lenox, because yeah. I was way down in New Lenox for my hands across Southland. So after we did that, we didn't know what, what would we do next, but we continued, we didn't do hands across the Southland again. It was humong a humongous job getting all the municipalities uh, ready to accept us and the police departments to make the way for us, things of that sort. But that organization uh, every year had a special event a Unity Day event. And so what, wh why these events? It's to stabilize the region, make people feel good about the region, make people not afraid to leave, and get people to know people from different communities. Uh, and so then Ron Bean called on us. Ron Bean was at GSU then, he was no longer uh, the village uh, president and had moved to uh, Olympia, Fields. Olympia Fields, which I call Park Forest North, um, <laughs> to see what they could do. And that's when Robin and I had both been to uh, the Chicago Dinners, which was run by their commission, one of their, their commission on human relations, uh, or it might have been the foundation. And they had dinners in different neighborhoods uh, to talk about any issues, mainly about race. And uh, theirs, you know, they had uh, different residents would organize it and they would, um, uh, they were the hosts and they would provide the meal or they'd meet in a restaurant. And Robin and I went to one at the University of Chicago. And you know how you're meeting people from new communities and new areas and getting to know them. And there was two Park Forest residents, the Settles, at our little dinner. Now these are not big dinners, these are little dinners. So we got to meet the Settles whom we already knew, but there were several other people we knew. But we used that model to start the diversity dinners and to get people from different communities in the region uh, to get to know one another if, um, and, and to celebrate the diversity of the, the community. Now, they could talk about anything as far as I was concerned. It didn't have to be a knuckles, hard knuckles a meeting, but just to find out what all you had in common, whether it was the Cubs or the White Sox or, or uh, fast food or whatever it was, and get to know one another. And that would help people uh, really blend and get to feel good about not just their community, but uh, the ones surrounding. People got into communities they had never been in. So we would always try to make sure you went to, uh, you know, for, we've, are we coming up on our 20th year now? Somehow we're coming up on the 20th year. Uh, and so each year we sort of toss the people up in the air so you're not going back to the same home with the same people and getting to know people. I always tell people who think, well, I've been to one, so I don't need to go to another. I said, but you've been to one Thanksgiving dinner. Don't 
don't you go every year? You've been to one, one family reunion, you know, don't you want to go again? And that's how we've kept it going. And we've kept it going by funding from municipalities and individuals. And unlike the Chicago dinners, um, there's no charge. People don't have to, I'm sorry, there was no charge for Chicago dinners. But the host, the food is pr provided free. They only have to provide um, coffee or, or water or sometimes wine. <laughs> and, and the food was delivered and catered. Uh, in fact, one of our staff people from uh, back there, from the um, Recreation and Parks Department's father was um, our first caterer for years and years and years, and he's back with us again. And what is it called now? It's uh, events, catering. events catering. But because of the support of the region and the communities, when we've been able to do that for 20, now going on 20 years, this 20 year we're going to be doing something a little different that I hope that you'll look for, forward to. Um, another thing that we in Park Forest got started with was the National Coalition Building Institute. Um, the police, someone from the police department came to me and they said, we want to do one of these um, racial sensitivity workshops or something crazy. And um, fortunately, we were, Robin and I and Barbara McKinley, we were involved in a statewide uh, organization that dealt with diversity. And while we were there, there was a training from the National Coalition Building uh, Workshop. And it, um, uh, it was something that we liked. What we liked about this training is that it's a highly interactive training, and it's not a lot of shaming and blaming. It's like a being able to understand where people's prejudice and records came from. Everybody was born innocent. We learned some of these things just from TV or teachers or our family. And uh, those are records that just get stuck and they're always there. It's like a computer, you know, if you, have, you may have lost something in your, uh, computer and you can't find it, but if the FBI came, they can find it. It's lost. And so that's what happens with us with our records about people and our first impressions. So that's what we liked about that. So we got a chapter that started in the, in the region because of uh, the support from the Village of Park Forest. And another thing that we did, I noticed you were talking about the houses on the slab. Well, as I told you, I was involved with the League of Women Voters. It's a wonder I don't have a big button on me, League of voters today um, and we it, we got the idea this is all about stabilizing and appreciating the region for our fundraiser we decided to do a house tour and we found that we were concerned that people were moving up in housing and that meant they left the village and so we decided to take some of those two bedrooms on a slab and other homes to show people how they can move up in housing and still stay in the village. And we did that for probably 15 or 20 years, um, uh, and it really works well. The residents would get ideas. They didn't have to go to Beverly to, sit, to that house tour to, to see, uh, get ideas for houses our size. And the homes that we feature in co-ops have been throughout the village. We've had Eastgate, we've had Lincolnwood, we've had um, custom houses, uh, we've had all the streets and the S's and the this and that over the years we would have at least four or five homes each year where people had done extensive remodeling. And that, again, was to demonstrate that you can stay in Park Forest and move up in housing. Now our market, and we took advantage, the village did, of marketing the, commu the communities. As I kind of said earlier, I didn't realize you had to market a community in order to attract businesses and residents. But some of our marketing opportunities came about because Park Forest had the Scenic 10, which used to be just a little neighborhood run where people got together, I don't know, and on Saturday morning, John, I'm not sure, uh, and ran and it, it, it evolved into, um, uh, do any of you remember the Scenic 10? Anybody here? Right. And uh, like thousand runners would come and they'd come from, and even Kenya. We'd even get runners from Kenya. And so we saw that as a as a village 
um, people and uh, administrators as a way to market the village because it got people out here from all over, as I said, um, from all over the region and states, different states in Kenya. Uh, I worked the water stop in the woods, my family and I and my grandchildren. We worked the family, uh, the first stop in the woods in the forest preserves and um, we would be standing there with our water, uh, the handout, and the first people coming through, we didn't even hear them. They were the Kenyans, and, and they did not stop at all. They would whiz them by, they were so quiet. But by the time we got to the middle of the race, people were stopping to help us with the water stop. Those were the, those were the everyday runners. But that was a great marketing tool for the village, for people to notice who we were and, uh, and what we do. The other event that occurs, occurs regularly and is going to occur this weekend is the art fair. That is something else that helps us promote the village and um, we can just tie ourselves onto their wings as they're, that's why we support those kind of uh, organizations because you get the artists here to know about Park Forest but you also get people coming in to shop at this jewelried art fair. If you have never been there, uh, please come out. It's a, it's really a wonderful affair. And then for a few years we had something called, you know how they had the taste of had the taste of Chicago. They still have it. Well, they couldn't outdo us. We decided we were going to have Park Forest pizzazz, and we had Park Forest pizzazz, and we had up and down Orchard Street. Um, tables and different service organizations would sell food from those tables. In fact, one year, you know, you were talking about Tom Dreesen. One year, he wanted to do, dedicate, we dedicate his, dedicate the, the run to his sister Darlene, who, what was it she had, John? Cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy, and he, they were out here. We're not sure what it was, but that was a big deal when we had him out. But, um, right, a lot of his companions. Uh, who was it? Somebody from one of the TV shows, um, sitcoms that was here with them. So whenever things like that happen, they're very important to us. As I said, we have to market the community. And so we tag on to those groups because that is uh, very important. So there's a, a couple of things I want to end with. And I want to first say that Tom, uh, John, no wait, 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 Dave Bowles, who was used to be assistant to the village manager and I wrote a book about, uh, not a book, a little uh, document that he filed with a municipal organization, a magazine, uh, about Park Forest and its efforts at integration and, and all of our ordinances and things of that sort. And we started out by saying Cultural diversity has only begun to shape the effectiveness and quality of our organizations and communities, and it will have even more profound influences in the future. And at the end, you know, when Tom talked about, we'll talk about, you know, what you can do to help us at this, because we're, we're integrated. If, no matter if there's 10 to 90, you know, Robin always says she couldn't understand why we could be the coffee in, but they had to have well, the cream, we could, yeah. I don't know, cream in the, cream in the coffee, but if people, yeah, they define integrated, integ uh, successful integration as majority white, and that isn't necessarily so, especially with national demographics changing. But in conclusion, Dave and I wrote, actions a local government may pursue to foster cultural and racial diversity include the preservation of a strong local government offering quality services, practical and enforceable local ordinances that encourage a unitary housing market. Unitary means everybody's looking at it, not just one group. Effective working relations ships with the real estate community and meaningful support of and participation in regional organizations interested in promoting fair housing and multicultural communities. Now, that was my conclusion, but it just occurred to me, I forgot to tell you about the mediation task force that Tom talked about. When we found that residents weren't getting along with one another, and um, we, at first, um, 
I, I think oh, it was Dio Gardi and I, Don DeMarco had started meeting with residents who weren't getting along together. When he left, uh, um, Officer Dio Gardi and I would meet with residents who were in dispute and try to help them resolve their issue. And we realized because we were, quote, village officials, people looked to us for the answers. People only buy into things if they have helped design the solution. So that's when we called on the uh, Department of Justice to come and train Park Forest residents that volunteered. And people came out that I'd never seen before, that I didn't even know were in Park Forest, that had this special skill for dealing with people. And, they, and so when people, when we trained them to be mediators, and we always sent people out if there was a black and a white uh, this, disputing, we'd always have a, a black or white um, mediator and co-mediator. We tried to make people feel they were re represented and if they were old or young we'd make sure we'd find one of our younger uh, mediators which was getting a little harder because we all didn't stay uh, young but just to be there to help them work through and we found that as people solved their own problems with the help of a mediator who didn't dictate that they bought into it and that was really a great uh, program that we ran for years but I never knew what we were going to be hit with I would be walking through the building department and I'd hear because see they were getting complaint about their neighbors condition of their neighbor's house and the village had been out there looking at it and they could see nothing wrong and I'd be walking through to go to the bathroom and I'd hear things like her name is Barbara Moore so anyway I knew it was going to be one that was um, that that was going to be ending up in mediation. So I just wanted to let you know about that. Tom had referred to it earlier. That's it.